Okay. Well, uh, councillors, uh, guests, welcome to those watching live. Welcome. This is the Economic Development Committee meeting, of the 14th of July, 2020. The, it is live streamed and will be throughout the proceedings. I'd ask if there are any apologies from the committee that uh, have been forwarded. Okay, we have an apology from uh, Francois. So I'd like to move that the apologies be accepted. I so move your worship. Councillor Martin, seconder. Councillor Hart, thank you. Thank you. Those in favour? Aye. So, move on to the declaration of interest, documents on team systems. And the if there are any changes, it's uh, it's here being circulated at the present time. Once again, if uh, if you feel there's an element of doubt, always take the uh, the non-risk path and, and declare the interest. Uh, next item on the agenda is the urgent items that are not present on the agenda. Uh, are there any items that need to be included? Thank you. Move on to the minutes of the 19th of May 2020 Economic Development Committee. Now they've been circulated via Teams. There's been no requests for changes that I'm aware of. Uh, are there any changes that uh, the councillor wish to bring up? Someone would like to move that they're a true and correct record. That's it. Oh. <laughs> councillor Martin, Councillor Hart, thank you. Those in favour? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Can you unplug your microphone? Is that better? No. Yes, much much better here, uh, Jenny. We can hear oh, you. Oh, is that? Yes. Okay, so move on to number yeah, five. From your end, I from me listening to you. Can you try turning your volume up? My volume's right up. Oh, hang on. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Move on to uh, item five on the agenda, which is the action list. And hand over to the Chief Executive. It's on page five of your agenda. Thank you, Your Worship. Use the slice of the so NZTA, um, we actually invited them uh, to council, they presented in the June council meeting. Uh, following on from that, uh, District Assets team are sitting down with them later this week to confirm um, actions going forward on a number of, uh, number of subjects. So they'll be working through that with NZTA, knocking them down to some actions. Uh, Second point, Mayor and CEO to meet with Development West Coast regarding resilience in the region. Um, this was to be raised at a key meeting, which was postponed and hasn't actually occurred for some time, and mainly to do with the action list uh, alongside the Lifelines Working Party. Uh, this will be raised at the next key meeting, which is due next week. Uh, Hoka Ticker Airport Terminal Upgrade, uh, request to see what that process or that pro program of work actually is. And we have the CEO of Destination Wrestling presenting that today. Uh, included um, in that request was an overarching view of the master plan for, this, for the airport. Uh, once again, um, we'll talk about that today at the presentation. And your request to include independent committee members on the Economic Development Committee. So I have a report for the, for the committee today to consider um, the worship and that's the action list. Thank you. We'll take the uh, action list as read. Do, does any councillor have a query to raise in relation to the action list? No. Thank you. Council like to move that the the action list be uh, received. Thanks, Jenny. 
Councillor Cogan, we have a seconder. Councillor Hart, those in favour? Aye. Thank you. Move on to item six on the agenda. And the first presentation is uh, the airport master plan. And it's being presented by uh, the Chief Executive of Destination Westland, uh, Melanie Anderson. Welcome, Melanie, and thanks for coming along. Kia ora Kato. Um, so, pretty much I was taking through these slides, um, which have, I think, already been circulated in teams. Um, just a quick overview as to the Port Ticket Airport um, gateway to the West Coast and where we're moving with our master plan. So terminal extension, as we all heard last week, part one of our airport master plan is underway uh, with a successful provisional road fund application. 1.24 million, um, which will extend the terminal by 50% of its current capacity. Um, this will provide more space for travellers and the meters and greeters for anyone who has may either travelled into or left the coast um, or been a meter or greeter. When we have a Q300 near capacity, it's a little bit crowded in the air at the moment. And during COVID and social distancing, this became even more evident. So this has been a really timely um, fund um, for us to receive. So also in that space, we have the opportunity to provide a little bit more um, information for travellers, as well as maybe some pop-up retail. Um, for those of you who already use it as a meeting space up at the cafe, it will have an enhanced meeting space to sit, enjoy, carry out meetings. Um, and also the big one for us actually, above the um, experience and the niceties of having extra space is should we need to activate security protocols by, through ABSET, the, secu uh, sorry, the security screening option is a lot easier for us to actually implement quicker and more efficiently. Thanks, uh, thanks Mel. Uh, Councillors, we'll, uh, we'll open up for discussion and uh, I think the easiest way would be to move around the table. Uh, Paul. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just looking through the, um, There's a few more slides. Yeah, there. through the plans, yeah, the slides. Um, but it's, um, yeah, I mean, this is terrific. So, so good. This boost supposed to be so, um, otherwise it was green. So, yeah. Awesome. It is. It's, um, it's very hard to fund that sort of expansion, um, at a regional airport level. Um, so the grant in itself um, is a huge step there. Councillor Martin. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Thanks, Melanie, for the report. It must have been a huge amount of work for you and the board um, to pull off, so well done. Councillor Cogan. Yeah, um, great work, Mel. That um, certainly was a hang of a lot of work that's gone into that. Um, I guess I'm just a little bit interested as part of the terminal extension, you know, because it's great we're receiving all this money, but um, do you have any indication of, you know, what that will enable us to extend within the terminal that will create more job opportunities? Um, so with that, it will be part of the working with local retail and um, information is one of those. Um, the other thing to um, bear in mind is this was an actual provincial growth fund application. It wasn't a PIF project. So while it's been um, come through at this time, um, it was actually not a PIF application. So not a shovel-ready application. Okay. Councillor Hart. Um, no, they're amazing. It's going to be great for the, for the airport. Um, now, first of all, congratulations with the uh, success of the application. And I know that you and the board at the time, which included uh, Councillor Martin, put a lot of effort into uh, 
uh, give you the crossing line. Um, is it a grant? It's a grant. It's a taxable income. <laughs> I haven't looked into that and I doubt it. <laughs> it's an asset, so I, I haven't looked into it. Haven't, at the moment, we've, we've only just had, as you know, the announcement last week, we haven't gone through the contract. Uh, what are the timelines, in your opinion? Uh, timelines are fairly crack. Um, hoping to have a shovel on the ground in by September and open. We're working on the detailed work plan as we speak. So we start by September. Um, now, the part two of the, uh, of the application, which of course is the lengthening the runway. The, this, so this application was only for the terminal extension. And the application to extend the runway to uh, uh, get us ready for, say, ATR 72s yep. is still live in the system somewhere. It's part of the PIF projects, yes. PIF, what does that mean? The, that was the. the yeah. I'm just giving you a joke, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yes, so um, as far as I'm aware, that hasn't been um, thrown out. Fantastic. Uh, councillors, uh, any other questions before we move to resolve to receive the report? There's actually more in the report, Your Worship. Are you got more to go? Yes. Fantastic. Keep it moving. <laughs> the extension. So, it's, this is just the um, very brief concept plans of the terminal extension as it's looking at this point in time. Um, you'll see that we've actually continued along with the existing roof line, um, adding on anything different, even though it would be, from my perspective, a lot more economical, would actually take away from what is there in the architectural design already there. So um, when you have multiple pitches, um, not a <laughs> anyone who's built anything, there's a lot of um, additional costs. So that will extend on. Shows there where it actually lies. So we're going towards the hangers. It's existing. And this is in the slides I believe were circulated previously, um, if you want to look in more detail. The main thing here and the reason that we are really um, happy to get this extension is it gives us an arrivals and departures space. It means that our people departing can go through one end and our people arriving will come through another. Yeah. And it means that separation. Mm. So that's the draft uh, for plan there. No, we'll go down to the uh, to the uh, no, 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 the uh, I guess the next one. We just got the list of um, additions, etc. The list of additions. That's it. No, I mean, no, no, sorry, no, no. Yeah. Keep going back. Really? Oh. Well, that was my first slide. Okay. Sorry, that's my first slide. Okay. Next one. Yeah. Um, it's the last slide. You want to know. Next one. Next one. Haven't, haven't got there yet. <laughs> well, I just saw it appear. Thought you moved over from it. No, not at all. Um, and I think this is what you were alluding to. You wish it. Where to next? Um, the runway extension is still actually um, part of our master plan for multiple reasons. One, a future press out airport for the extension of the Q three hundred and moving to the ATR. However, the other thing with it is by doing this, um, we would also want to convert from chip cell to asphalt, which is more attractive to your private traveller, wherever they may be from. And the reason for that is due to jets and jet engines. And where jet engines sit in relation to the wings, they sit low to the ground. Our current chip cell means that um, for anyone who's driven on chip, you get flux. And a flip of a chip into a jet engine is not a cheap fix. So by converting and transferring our main runway to asphalt, 
um, we're hoping to attract more debt um, type traders. Also on our master plan moving forward um, is our fly and drive um, concept. Um, as previously mentioned, Hawkatika Airport is a gateway to the west coast. You come in and we want people to experience and move through our region, hence the fly and drive concept and looking to work with partners in that space. Also, um, the space we have available to us up at the airport lends itself wonderfully to a commercial office park or other um, industrial type developments up there. And lastly, maybe Civil Defence Hub. Our airport is the highest airport on the west coast. It is safe from tsunamis. It has the airport and other key features, which makes it the perfect place for a civil defence hub to actually service the whole of the West Coast. Any questions? At the table, I think, Paul. Uh, through the worship, the um, fly and drive campaign concept is good. Um, I see this week where um, camper vans are available now for hire and grain. Um, would they be in Grand and in Hokitipa at the airport? That's something we can mm. try. Yeah. Well. It seems logical to have the campaign hired at the airport. Yeah. Okay. Yes, oh, look, I totally agree. I can agree with you more. Um, and it also allows um, the ability there to um, potentially work with the joint venture with others to actually progress there. Sure, your worship. Um, the Iwi Tourism Strategy had a concept of Camper Van Hire at the airport. Do you know if that's progressed at all? No, I think that was just a really an idea. Mm. Council Martin. Thank you, your worship. What I like about this is it's working towards a master plan, and I think it would have been beneficial for councillors for their information to. Um, see a copy of the master plan or the high level aspects of it which this connects so well into and um, because all of those things are provided for within the master plan so it's like anything any concept we're working towards for the district um, you can see all of these spokes coming off the sort of central hub and that is the airport and trying to diversify it and have the discussion with the community around aspects of it such as the civil defense hub and the commercial office blocks because they have pros and cons and understanding and supporting the, the airport growth is around actually ensuring that the community understand the strategic importance of the airport and all of the additional auxiliary sort of features that actually uh, an airport like ours allows for so yeah i I think it's easy then if the master plan is understood to be able to say, yeah, this is all locked and loaded and this is the strategy we're working towards. So, yeah, very supportive of this body of work. Just to quickly answer, once it's finalised, it still hasn't gone across the finalisation stage. And once mm. that master plan is finalised, then I'm sharing it at a high level is definitely part of the thing. Mm. Yeah. That's brilliant. Councillor Craig. Um, yes, so through the chair, a couple of things. Mel, just wanting to know, the runway extension and the conversion to Ashfield, will we, you know, I mean, will we be able to go for some form of funding as well to apply for both of those things, do you think? So we already have a shovel ready project application form in sitting at the moment that has the runway extension included in it and, oh. and the Ashfield conversion. Okay. Well, what are you looking at for the asphalt conversion? Um, I don't have the breakdown between the two because I've looked at it as a, a total project rather than an individual. But oh, it's okay. not cheap. No. <laughs> um, I, I like the idea with the fly and the drive with the camper vans, and I guess we'll be um, looking at expanding with rental, the rental cars as well, so that there's two or three perhaps rental car companies that will be operating out of there? 
Um, so we, are you meaning, and we already have the rental car companies. So at this point in time, we're looking at one clip of van potentially, depending on space as well. Okay. Um, so through the chair, I, I would like to, um, because often it's hard to look at this too without actually visualising what's existing as well. So um, I'd like to put forward an opportunity to be able to actually, um, and whether that's all councillors or, um, well, actually, I think that would probably be valuable that all councillors, that we have an opportunity to go up and have a look around up there. Um, not really sure, you know, what's ours and what's not around that commercial office park facility and, you know, potentially where the civil defence hub and stuff would go. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll arrange that, uh, Councillor Coe. Thanks. Yep. Councillor uh, No, the concept's great. Nothing for me. I'm oh, sorry, through the worship team, uh, just further on the, um, the asphalt <coughs> option. Mm. Um, yes, terribly expensive. Mm. Um, I know from um, what I, because we have prices for that currently. And, um, what about the uh, future maintenance? I mean, it has to be resealed every few years. Um, want to re asphalt every few years? So we, we, yeah, exactly. We already um, reseal. We already have a resealing program. Yeah. So it would be um, slightly more, but and that would be part of the, potentially what we looked at with the um, whoever wins that contract as well is to provide a certain level of years of percentage, um, sort of like the way the um, painting program maintenance type jobs go as well. So it's not quite as big an impact and it continues the life of the asset. Do you know from other regional airports how often they have to re, re Not in, Normally it's done in bits. So um, it depends also on how well you look after the asset itself and what size aircraft you've got coming in and how hot your how hot your runway is um, and, <laughs> and um, moisture, and there's a whole raft of things. So, no, I don't know exactly how often. Um, it would be something that I'd have to investigate. At this point in time, it's on the, this is what we'd like to do. Um, but before we even have the funds to do it, um, the maintenance program will come in sort of around that time. I'd like to move the what we receive. I can move it. Quiet. Councillor Hunt. Councillor Cogan, those in favour? Aye. Aye. Now we'll move on to the pensioner housing strategy. Um, and the uh, floor is yours once again. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, we have currently gone out to a couple of providers to ask them to put together a um, body of work and an analysis of what we need um, how, and how to meet the needs of um, our community that we have here. Specifically, um, so the scope looks at our current situation. What have we got, which we do know? Where is it located? What condition is it in? Um, it also a how much ratepayer contributions need to go towards it, what are the risks involved, and how long it, what's on our waiting list. That's what we currently know. And from there, we want to look at what can we do in this space. What have we got available land already um, to put housing on? Where's the best place for housing? What's the best design, not only to meet commercial return, if that's what we're looking at, but to be efficient, warm, dry, easy to maintain, reduce maintenance costs, and so forth. And what are going to be our future demands? And again, favourite topic, risks. Okay. As part of that um, strategy, we also want to look at funding. At the moment, we don't believe we're actually accessing all of the available funding sources that we have available um, for our aged housing. What other government subsidies are out there in order to 
subsidise the capital works programs for the council-owned um, housing stock, any operating costs that can be subsidised, and ownership. Who is the best entity to own the asset? In other words, should WDC or Destination Westland be the provider of housing in the social spectrum? What are the impacts ongoing commitment liability? What impact is it going to have? Should the current land and buildings housing stock be transferred to, for example, CCO or another entity? Um, what are the financial impacts? What are the impacts on balance sheet tax implications? Are we right just to be looking at pensioner only housing? Or should we be looking at other areas of the housing cont um, continuum? What numbers, different models, need, are needed to meet not only our current wait list, but the future demands? So a little bit of modelling work on our population. Crystal ball gazing a little bit into where Hawkertick is going um, forward, our population growing, shrinking, growing, obviously. Um, and got that there. Assessment of rental. Who should our tenants be? Currently at the moment, um, there's set criteria, uh, you know, it's age 65 with a um, rating system for those that are over 70, have a higher priority. And what, once we get that, we'll be able to put together a strategy for council housing um, that can then be included in the LTP going forward. Sorry, Mel. I'm just having a bit of a, bit of a laugh at the the very first one that you've got there. I think there's a bit of a spell. Oh, I saw it. <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't go past looking at what it's there. No, but he's picked that up, Councillor Cogan. I don't know whether I should be impressed that you did or not. Sorry. Um, Mel, look, uh, thanks for the report. Um, Councils will take it as read and we'll open it for discussion. Um, and we'll go uh, we'll go right to left this time. Uh, Councillor Hart. Um, no, I think it's it's great to do that assessment, and I think obviously Hope Digger does definitely need more pensioner housing. So yeah, we'll start there. And that's it exactly. Yeah. You're right. That's a start point so we yeah. know. Uh, jo, you wish to... Uh... I do, sorry. Um, so from a DWC perspective, there will be a aged care strategy produced within the next 90 days. It's on my list. And that's actually looking at all of the different types of funding models for different aged care strategies. So at the cross-sector forum, which Mel was at, it was amazing that there is an issue acknowledged here in Hobbitic, which is, or in Westland, which is your remit, but across the whole course. So I'll call from the other councils as well what they've looked at and actually get that working group to make sure that we can get the best benefit across due to um, um, the volume. So there's there's quite a few different care models out there and different funding models with them, which works only been done about three or four different times on. So um, I will link in with Mel just to make sure that work doesn't get reworked again. And again. And again. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Kogan. Yeah, um, thanks for that presentation, Mel. A, a, a lot of that was all, you know, very much on, on in the front of my mind around some of the questions, um, particularly too around who should own it. Um, and I, I guess that we have to take into uh, consideration the financial implications of that as well with the current council and CCO structures um, but I'm sure that, um, and I would think that there's already been quite a bit of work done on this with the ex uh, pre board previous to, you know, them actually all departing. Um, that's probably put some thought already into some of these questions. Yes. Hey. Yeah. 
Um, yes, there has been some thought put into it, but it's about getting an independent analysis rather than if we present something that says um, Destination Wrestling believes this without um, something a little bit outside, it's a little bit um, hard to remove a conflict of interest there, and it would probably um, favour what we wanted out of it. Councillor Martin. Thank you very much for the report, Melanie. I have nothing further to um, quiz you or question you about. I just think it's like anything, lock and load the strategy and then execute on the strategy. Let's not make another strategy yep. that sits in this building and collects dust somewhere. Let's actually agree it, agree it politically and then let's uh, deliver on it within the next two years. Certainly your uh, experience over the last three years will be invaluable going mm -hmm. forward. Uh, Paul. Um, thank you, Marisha. Yes, um, delivery is the key on, on this. We talked about it for a long time. A um, couple of things. Um, one, obviously, in terms of you know, future locations, um, no doubt you'll be talking to um, the Taipotin plan, planning team um, because this has been talked about on the fringes so far. and. Um, there's a, um, a huge to get him on elevated in the future um, in Hope Ticker. Um, secondly, is um, uh, um, I'd also hope that in the strategy you'll you look beyond Hope I know you've got Ross, but um, Wataran in particular is, um, is somewhere that's, that really does warrant um, pension and housing for South Western residents. doesn't matter where they are in South Western. If, they would, could retire to Wataran, I think they'd be happy. They wouldn't have to leave South Westland, but yeah, at the moment, of course, there's no option. Um, and um, I mean, we had looked at this uh, as a room um, for a number of years ago um, for Komato housing, basically. Um, and at that stage, we were looking at the, um, the Wataran Hospital, okay. mm -hmm. um, which is um, available again. Um, but I think it's uh, um, yeah, with with one. I really commend um, for to look at options for what are our, if you if there's op, um, possibility of funding, um, external funding, um, then um, I would seize that that one. Um, Command also possibly, um, but in particular what are our, because it would service that whole that whole. Um, um, yes, thanks, Paul. Um, if there are no more questions, would someone like to move that the report be received? Councillor Hart. Councillor Martin, those in favour? Aye. Thank you. Uh, Mel, thanks very much, and uh, look forward to the opening. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the, the next uh, the next presenter, Tanya, of course, is uh, on the upskill program. Uh, Tanya is with Development West Coast. She's she's going to uh, you've got a PowerPoint, haven't you? I do, I hope everything's sent through to you guys and it's ready to help. Okay. Well, whilst it's thinking, um, kia ora koutou koutoua. thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a pleasure. Um, I've been up in Pukatika uh, a few times over the last week, talking to a few businesses that are looking to expand, um, and the indications I've got so far have been really positive. So, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that once we get the slide going. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to give you an overview of what the Upskill project is, um, the funding that's available and what we hope to achieve over the two years that we have funding for so far. 
Um, so the project is funded from a portion of the PGF funding, and it's allocated to help regional skills development and business development here on the West Coast, and particularly focusing on skills and employment um, within the whole West Coast region. Um, primarily, we're looking at how we can support businesses with new recruits, and if those new recruits need training to develop into those roles, the funding is there to, to pay for the upskilling of those people um, within long-term employment opportunities. We're wanting to help people within the West Coast region who are going to be staying in the West Coast region to gain industry qualifications, industry recognised, um, that relate to them growing within the specific business that they're being employed into. Our um, funding from MB, um, our MIU, stipulates that we need to reach at least 90 people, that's individuals, either into work or if they're already employed within a business, we can help people to gain promotion or to grow into a different role within an organisation as well. Um, already, so I started on this project just over four weeks ago. We've been busy setting up the processes and the sort of infrastructure of how it's going to be working, but um, as I'll talk to you in a moment, indications are that it's going to far exceed 90. Um, so, uh, yes, it's about trying to stretch the funding that we've got to reach as many people effectively as possible. On a case-by-case -case basis, so we're looking to meet individual business needs. Um, we're looking at allocating a maximum of $10,000 of training investment per person over a two-year period. So I thought an easy way to sort of describe how the project may work is to give you a current case study, something that I'm actually working on at the moment. I met an engineering company in Greymouth recently. They employ 25 full-time to part-time people. Um, the clients enrolled with the upskill project, or the criteria is met. I will tell you what the criteria for each employer is shortly. Um, and we've identified that they need to recruit a, a trainee draftsman. They've got a draftsman in place at the moment that's retiring in a couple of years. The business is expanding. Um, they've tried to recruit for this role in the past and have found it really difficult to find somebody with the right um, qualifications. So we're suggesting that we create, help them to create an internship for the business. So the company will be responsible for advertising for the role. Um, they have to have good HR um, processes in place. If they identify somebody that doesn't have the right skills, the upskill project will be able to provide the cost of the training for that draftsman internship over the next two years. So that alleviates the, the cost, the burden of cost for the training, knowing that we won't be able to probably recruit the right person fully skilled. And we're working with the Ministry of Social Development. So if they recruit somebody that's currently unemployed, they may also be able to get some, um, some funding from the ministry to um, allow some wage subsidies for that person whilst they're in training as well. Uh, that person will be bonded to the company for at least the two years um, to, to allow, obviously, them to grow and stay within the organisation. So the process that we follow, we hope is quite simple. We engage with the client, the business. Um, we ask for position descriptions and skills needs um, to be written up for, for roles. So in this case, there's an internship role, and by the time they finish the training, that person will be a fully qualified draftsman. We identify the skills gaps in between, and then we um, help them to draw up a training plan. We approve the training plan with um, industry recognized providers. Um, and then I send the bill off to Joe <laughs> at Development West Coast and we get the training, the, the training paid for. So at the moment for that one role, we've got two local, uh, new, new local kind of guys that are um, looking at that position. And again, I just wanted to give you an example of the kind of people that are in our communities at the moment looking for work. Um, we have two guys here, Pete and Simon, and both got a vast amount of experience behind them, um, the engineering firm are looking at them for a couple of reasons. Um, they're mature guys in the 
that is 40s, got some business experience behind them, both have got um, some mechanical or civil construction experience behind them, and both are wanting to move into something new, um, and both um, relocated here around the COVID time. Um, Pete's job was um, made redundant as he was managing um, uh, jetboat business in Queenstown, and Simon's moved here with his partner who was made redundant from Queenstown. I think the really important thing to note is both candidates um, are wanting to live and, and work here long term. Both candidates are wanting to raise their family here, and both candidates are wanting to buy a home here. So, the criteria for businesses to be um, enrolled in the upskill program obviously, the business needs to be in a stable position. We don't want to be investing money into trading opportunities and into the development of people and um, for businesses that aren't going to be able to sustain them in those places of employment. So, we just ask for a simple letter of solvency from the accountant to prove that. Any newly created positions or positions that we're looking to um, advance people in do need to be 30 hours or more per week. And we have a discussion about how these roles are actually going to help the, the business or the organisation grow and be sustainable in the future. Um, I mentioned before, training must be industry recognised. That doesn't have to be NCEA, it can be any industry qualification um, or training. Um, we've already come across a few things where new courses might need to be developed. For example, um, I've met with three different um, fishing organisations, Westport and Greymouth, and um, we've already identified that there's some pathway training that needs to be developed here on the coast. We've got the deep sea fishing school, um, and, we, and we've got the primary ITO. Uh, but nothing that's actually working here on the West Coast for offshore fishing at the moment. Um, so we're talking to the Polytechs and, and seeing if we can actually help develop and fund something where we could get potentially 12 new recruits trained as deckhands within the next year. Um, also out of Reefden um, Distillery, talking to them about their needs and they've got a wonderful growth plan um, for the next five years, but there isn't actually a distilling qualification in the whole of New Zealand. Really? Really. So you can do some online courses. Um, <laughs> and that's quite appealing, isn't it? There's a few hobby, there's a few hobby distilling um, courses that you can do, um, but no specific qualifications. So again, it opened up the discussion as to how can we help that to progress forward? Um, if, if their development plan goes ahead at the Reefton Distillery, they're looking at at least five new positions over the next three years. Um, and at the moment, they're looking at internal training to their own systems. But um, we were talking about a young recruit that they tried to, to get in straight from high school. And the parents of that young recruit said, well, actually, we would really prefer it if you went and did an apprenticeship somewhere where you're going to get a qualification. They didn't see the value in them going straight into work without the ability of the person, <coughs> that, young, that young guy from Brisbane Area School being able to get a qualification. So that's quite exciting mm. development of work that can be happening. Um, upskill, part of our role will be to monitor the progress and the effectiveness of the training. So we're not just going to um, say, there you go, off you go. We will monitor them for up to um, 24 months. Make sure the training has been implemented and the people are still involved in the company and they're growing in the way that we, we hoped. And we ask every employer to bond each of the people that they recruit or are in the company to a training bond agreement, which is a real win-win for us um, to secure them in and for the business to hopefully secure them as long as possible. Candidate criteria, so people looking for work or within the, the company already. Um, this is part of what the business needs to be upskill on. It's not going to be um, doing reference checks on every candidate, but we need to know that the business is doing so and that they're getting the right people into the jobs that we're supporting the training for. They need to want to work full time and demonstrate the ability to be able to complete the training programs that we're helping to fund. So I just wanted to give you a quick overview. As I said, we've only launched in the last couple of weeks. We've already got 22 current clients. 
um, must support Briefton, Bromer, Pocatica, spanning those industries. And there's a pile more that I haven't got to yet. Um, just a bit on some promotional work that's coming up. We've um, partnered with the um, Ministry of Social Development, and this is led by Tepatini Polytechnic for a roadshow covering Greenmouth, Wokotika, Harihari, Franz, Reefden, Kadamia, and Westport. And that's just to get out to stakeholders and the wider community and let them know what we're doing, along with what the Polytech are doing, and along with initiatives from the Ministry of Social Development, all of which link obviously really well. And if you go to the Development Cross Coast website, so if you're talking to employers in the area that you think may benefit um, from the program, they can just click onto the DWC website um, and there's a page there about our skill. And as of next week, we'll have um, some Facebook and social media stuff going on to let the community know. And of course, we'll be going to the paper. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Some positive news story. Um, so I, I came on board a few weeks ago. Um, I'm going to be managing the project. And we have Anna Bailey. She's starting on Monday next week as an employment training consultant with us. So we can really get the ground running. Fantastic. And um, any questions? I'm really, really welcome. <coughs> well, councillors, it's... Uh... It's a program that uh, I can see just huge potential, mm. but um, let's let's open it up for discussion. Uh, Paul. Um, yeah, thank you, Worship. Uh, this, is a, this is precisely the type of thing that Development East Coast ought to be doing, in my view. Um, and um, this thing leaves another initiative, so we talking last week to Joe Burney, um, that are in the pipeline. Um, Getting out and um, meeting the businesses, etc., mm. looking and assessing what their needs are. That's what DWC needs to be doing. Mm. And now, of course, is the right time to do it. So, this has arrived at the right time. Um, I like it. And um, yeah, I thought it's got great potential. Um, DWC, I think, has had a um, quite a major shift, uh, had, had become risk averse. Um, it was all about protecting the nest egg, etc. But this type of thing is, um, is what's needed. Um, and it's the panacea we need right now. So I like that. great. Councillor Mark. Thank you very much. Thanks very much Sam, for the presentation. It was great. It aligns with, I can't, um, you know, agree with Paul's comments any more than other than saying I agree with Paul's comments because it absolutely aligns with where we need to be heading and all of the strategy around education, which I'm really passionate about, which I'm so excited that DWC is finally getting back involved in and that whole space around job readiness and employment readiness and actually matching that to real jobs in our community. I, I think this needs to be extended and rolled and I think that will be the challenge because I think you're going to be oversubscribed, like you yeah. said, and actually making it sustainable. So irrespective of government funding, something like this should be part of the course in terms of what an um, economic development agency should be doing anyway, getting beside businesses who are usually so busy in the here and now, small businesses that just, you know, day to day and actually say, what about this opportunity for growth? How do we do this? Who can we support to get into this position? And I think um, all of the work that's going in now, seen inside a wider strategy around employment, and uh, um, it's fantastic. It's really timely that um, the government have announced the free fees for apprenticeships as well. Many of the businesses I'm going into are saying, can we help with apprenticeships? And we actually don't need to take any portion of the upskill funding for that at the moment. So that's great. That means we can concentrate on other areas of training. Well, I think about, um, through your worship, I think about all of the jobs that in all of the different organisations I've sat on and the inability or the difficulty around recruiting mm -hmm. for the West Coast. Um, and often there's a huge disconnect between the output 
at secondary level or tertiary level, and actually the requirements of employees here, at, whether it's skilled planners within this building or people that want to be doing um, shift work roles or you know, engineering roles, the ability to do this properly, um, I think it's going to really be a game changer and change the narrative for the West Coast, which is at the moment we can't find anyone for their roles mm -hmm. to actually, we've got people, we've got this ability now to train those people to a skill set gap that's missing within our employment, within our workforce. So, uh, yeah, full, full support for the initiative and let us know how we can help. One of the things that we've identified as a potential risk um, for the project is the, uh, the lack of tra training providers actually based here on the coast. Um, so the businesses themselves will um, have to be, there's not enough money in the in the budget to be able to pay for training providers to come. We can pay for the actual facilitation, um, but already when we're looking at, um, oh, so a company in Westport and another company in Greymouth that need to expand some workshop staff to become qualified welders. Um, that's not actually viable here um, through the politics at the moment. Um, so we need we need to be thinking in, in a more development about that. Um, yeah, it's going to be a struggle for us. Councillor Cody. Yeah, thanks very much, Tania, for your presentation. Um, I'm in full agreement with the other councillors around this is very timely that this um, opportunity comes along. Um, my biggest concern, I guess, which would potentially be yours as well, is the manpower you're going to be able to need to get out there <laughs> and actually, you know, get around these businesses. And, and I'm sure there's plenty of, of opportunity within existing businesses out there, but it's having the time to spend with them to look at the bigger picture of where they want to go. And um, but it's also not only that, because I mean it's great to be able to help with funding towards getting someone into that business. But I guess from the business perspective, they also have to look at the opportunity of how potentially they're going to grow their income to be able to take on that liability. Um, so, yeah, but fully, um, fully support any opportunity for anyone to be able to upskill. Um, there's certainly a big gap um, uh, in that opportunity over on the coast, and it's really great to see now Development West Coast too coming on board to and giving and providing funding to be able to get people upskilled so that they can take on these. Um, bigger and better job roles. Thank you, Councillor, and you're right. Um, and it's not, it's a project that's within Development West Coast, so there's so much more business support at Development West Coast for businesses. So if I go out to a company and I already have, and um, I can see where they're wanting to go, but they might not have all the right processes in place, they might not have the HR systems or and, and so on. So mm. in that case, that's where um, I talked to Joe and the team at Development West Coast to make sure they are getting the full wraparound support um, for their growing businesses. Most of the businesses that I've spoken to already are um, in that civil construction, um, engineering, um, plumbing, those roles that are looking at all those um, other PGF funds, funded projects like the new bridge building and so on, um, that is guaranteeing them a, a decent amount of work over the foreseeable three to five years. Um, yeah, and then some that have interest me, like uh, the kitchen here in Portega, still struggling to find staff and recruits, so we're looking at how we can help them. But um, yeah, by no means is the upskill project a an HR solution, recruitment solution project. Um, it's, it's part of that. Um, so I'm just jumping on that. With the business growth, we've got the capability and growth advisors who work very closely with Tanya. So again, we've got them out and about. And um, both with Chris and Ian, who are still relatively new. They are up and down on the West Coast quite often. And you will see that we've just put out a new release today that we've got extended regional business partner funding. So when they go out or when Tanya goes, this business can do with some um, capability, succession planning, some business planning, and um, continuity, all of that, we can actually go like what regional business providers do we have here? And um, because the funding's just been rolled over again, we've got funding to put 
specialist people with those businesses to help them with that. So we are looking at the whole package. We're just looking at it in different angles to make sure that we can use the government funding to the best of its ability. Council yeah. Hart. Um, thanks for the presentation. All right. Yeah, I fully support it. It's a huge potential for the West Coast and um and obviously it's well needed right now in our community. So yeah. Awesome. Well anyone else have any yeah. raised? Well, Just a couple of questions, Tony. Um I was I was part of the application process, so I, I endorse it and uh, the question in terms of other entities that you've yet to approach, we've got a massive dairy company down the road here, and, and uh, I think they should be leveraging this significantly if we have looked at development. I think they're always looking outside the region for people. There's enough capacity on the coast to actually grow some of the town's capability. Definitely. And the other one is obviously a, um, local government departments. Mm -hmm. We've got mm -hmm. Alluded to, we've got planning roles, engineering roles, mm. uh, and finance roles to develop over time. And we, we, we once again struggle to attract people. Mm. So we've uh, we've started, a, I suppose, a, a look at internal promotion versus external as a, a first step. If there is anyone capable to step up, yeah. so um, we'll be putting our hand up definitely for some funding in the near future. Fantastic. Yeah, when Hannah comes on board next week, she's um. We have her from the London Recruitment Agency. She's a Kiwi that's moved back to um, Roma. Um, I can't wait for her to come on board because it's just been a, it's, has been a little bit chicken and egg. We've been trying to set up the processes to make sure we've got so all the employers can enrol online. It's really easy and simple. They can upload their documents online. We've got easy, mm. easy ways for um, people to do things. Um, yeah, no, I was at um, Great District Council last week talking to them about project management training and things for yeah. general. Um, current people and um, around, uh, around the councils, and I noticed a whole heap of new advertising that came on board from Western Milk Products last week. I think five new vacancies online, so that's what Hannah will be identifying. Any current vacancies, she'll be out there approaching employers saying, Look, we're here to help and making sure everyone knows what we can help right. and support. So, the other question is when the two million runs out, how, how can it be sustainable mm -hmm. for the long term? Mm -hmm. We'll address that at the time. <laughs> yeah. So, so before the time, I should say. <coughs> yeah, I think obviously more more applications of funding, but um, businesses are already recognising the need, and um, maybe a bit of easy pace could come into it after a couple of years of success growing. Mm. Not sure yet. Tony, from a practical point of view, yeah. I've had uh, I've had personally five people approach me, which I'll pass on. Mm -hmm. um, how do my councillors, who do they connect with when someone in the community uh, says, I'm looking at taking on mm. an aluminium welder and uh, yep. or I want to have trained them. So are you the connection? Absolutely. So they can yeah. just go on the development West Coast site. Um, there's not a live link there yet. There will be at the moment, it just directs them to my mobile or my email. Um, but within the next couple of days, there'll be a live link. The employee can just click on there, and it takes them immediately to a portal where they enter all the details, and that emails me directly. And by the time they've emailed me from that portal, I've got an idea of what they're looking for. The portal connects me to any advertising that they've got online at the moment, so I can see um, any jobs that they're advertising, and yeah, we'll be in touch with them as soon as we can. So 02746876819. That's the hotline. That's the hotline. Email would be good. Start. It's going to start ringing in a minute. Some people are reluctant to go through the the online process. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we'll just call about the offices and they'll be in touch. I think the sum will be very adequate. And um, I'll make sure that happens in on there as of the next. We'll give her a day. Of course. So, and, and that means that we can circulate our councils with uh, how, you know, a, a process how to go about it. Mm -hmm. Look, thanks very much for that. I think uh, the general feeling is pretty exciting, really. Uh, it, it looks to me like a, uh, a process that um, we'll all be able to get aligned. And, uh, and I think the problem will be that potentially that 90 won't be enough. Mm -hmm. um, we know. But certainly, that's um, well done. And let's. Uh, Let's ensure that this becomes a regular presentation with the council so that we can get our community to link with you and to DWC so that 
these uh, opportunities are recognised and people take it out. So I'd like to move that the report be received. Yeah. Happy to move, Your Worship. Oh, I've got everyone who wants to do it. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Councillor Martin, okay. Councillor Cohen, those in favour? Aye. Aye. Well done. Um, let's move on to Mark Davies. Welcome, Mark. May I join the table, Mayor? If you can, then I'll be possibly able to sit in Councillor Davidson's. I feel like I need to move as. Yes. Yes. I know, I know. I'm fortunate to be his next door neighbour, so. Uh, got to, um, Mark, we're, um, you're here to talk about jobs for nature. We are being live streamed. Um, can you tell us that? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Mayor. Thank, thank you, Councillors um, and Paul. Um, nice to, um, to be here. And I, I know I've, um, you've got half of the story, so I'm, I'm hopefully we'll be able to, um, I suppose, uh, share the, the broader concept. I mean, as we all know, we're in this post-COVID environment and the government announced in its May budget a, a really big recovery package um, entitled Jobs for Nature. And the Jobs for Nature package is about $1.1 billion, um, and that um, funding is coming via a number of agencies, and DOC is one of those agencies. I think um, there's at least five agencies that, that we are working with in that sort of whole um, government, all of government environment, um, um, Ministry for the Environment, um, Ministry for Business, Innovation and Employment, um, Land Information New Zealand and MB and DOC, so the five agencies. Um, the Jobs for Nature work stream is coming down um, via DOC and, and it is 200 million of that one point um, one billion dollars. Um, the concept of Jobs for Nature is, um, first of all, about sustaining um, communities and businesses um, that are already in place, that their staff and their workforce are, are being um, displaced um, because of post-COVID um, um, impacts. And as we know, across the West Coast, and I, I know um, both Mayors and Chairs Forum um, have had um, a couple of presentations from Craig Churchill, uh, the MSD Commissioner. So you understand, the, the, I suppose, the, the, the really the, the details of the impact of um, loss of jobs and, and, and um, uh, the need for redeployment across the coast. And it is quite variable. Um, the Buller, um, and, and I haven't got the figures in front of me, the latest figures, but, but the Buller has been um, less impacted, Grey has been to a, a greater degree more impacted, but the major impact of, of post-COVID um, and um, the borders being up has certainly felt heavily in South Westland, or well, Hokitika South, the South Westland. Um, that will be of no surprise to all of you. Um, the role that uh, Jobs for Nature um, is trying to um, perform um, is to work with those businesses um, and those employers um, to actually be able to redeploy those, um, their staff who aren't able to work in the business um, into roles um, in nature. And when we talk about nature, we're not, not necessarily talking about conservation. Um, conservation, um, th this is not about $200 million coming to the Department of Conservation. Um, this is about money coming into regions and money coming into um, uh, businesses to, to work in nature, which is both on uh, public conservation land and off public conservation land. Um, and as you um, would have heard for, through numerous announcements over the last couple of weeks, um, there has been um, significant early, and we call them quick wins, but early projects announced to get um, this, um, I suppose, available funding and opportunity to redeploy um, people in the regions in place as quickly as possible. The role the department's been playing is facilitating the setting up of, of, of a regional, we're calling it alliance, but it is a collective um, of both um, the two Rudanga, the department and the regional council and development West Coast so that we've got a bit of a coordinated approach um, to how this will be 
um, managed um, and that the opportunity will be taken um, inside um, Typo 10 um, West Coast. And we are pretty well advanced with that and how, how that will um, be structured and um, will then um, receive funding and then allocate funding to projects. Um, because the need in South Westland, um, the, the recognition of the need and the impact is, is so significant, um, we took the initiative um, and started a pilot program actually during uh, level uh, two. Um, as we came out of level four into level three, we started planning. We saw that the impact would be in Southwestern with the majority of the impact. Um, so we set up a pilot and um, took on, I think, about 12 um, displaced um, um, staff out of the glacier guiding companies. Um, and piloted what Jobs for Nature could look like in South Westland. Um, and we have grown that pilot um, over the last few weeks um, to about 50. Um, and we have got, um, you know, aspirations and time to grow that even further. Um, but so we're, it's, uh, we're designing and building and delivering the ship as well as flying it at the same time, um, because this is about jobs. Um, and as the Prime Minister has said many times, jobs, 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 now, 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 um, because the impacts um, are really um, come into play. Um, but our focus is definitely South Westland. Um, we're working closely um, with the community and closely with uh, Te Runanga or Makafio, um, and we're feeling, um, we understand the, 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 the significance of this and the need to get it up and running um, quickly. So I'd be keen for questions, please. The 50s are a, a really good start, in my view. A really good start. Um, councillors will, will open up for questions. Uh, Paul. Um, thank you, I don't have any questions, just comments. In safe hands, it wheels off, or I can say it's been well planned. So. Councillor Mark. Mm, thank you, uh, Mark, for your presentation. I think this consistent theme over all the presentations and to, to that we've had today is around collaboration, and it's another presentation that fits into that and with you know wide stakeholder engagement. So it is going to be well delivered, it appears. So yeah, what it's, I guess my questions are similar to Simon's early comment about sustainability and what that means going forward beyond the announced package. But I guess is the intention to transition people into jobs within DOC permanently, or is it a bit away from that to these uh, placeholder roles? So, so th thank you, Councillor. Um, there's probably a number of components to that. I mean, the first one is for this funding to actually go into the existing businesses um, and entities, because they there might be, you know, trusts and mm -hmm. other um, even community groups um, that the opportunity to, to I suppose, grab and set up jobs for nature um, will sit within a number of entities. But we want the, the the business community and fabric of those communities to be sustained. Um, because we do know if all of those people who have been displaced out of employment leave the district, mm. the district will not be able to survive and take the recovery when it comes. Now, we do know um, and that recovery will come in time. We just don't know when that recovery will come. Um, and um, what the purpose of this you know, um, funding from the government is to ensure that those businesses are in a position when recovery starts to um, um, come, that they're well placed to take it. So the Jobs for Nature, and, and I use the Glacier Guides, and we've got a relationship with both Franz Joseph Glacier Guides and the Fox Glacier Guides, is that they're contracted to do work um, in nature, but they've also got their core work to do. So when it's fine and there's clients, they'll go and guide. When it's wet and there's no clients, they'll go and cut a track, gravel a track, paint a hut, do some weed control, build some um, pest boxes. I mean, yep. that's a very simplistic yep. explanation, but that's the concept. Mm -hmm. um, mm. um, the sustainability of it, um, this is a four-year recovery package. 
Um, I mean, that's the horizon that the government is committed to. Um, I mean, certainly our goal is that within that time we will be um, in a, a, a recovered or on the pathway um, to recovery. Um, but those, th those skills will remain in the community um, and that work, the benefits of that work will remain in that community. And that's a good thing. That's why it's, the benefactor is nature and our community. No, thank you very much. Councillor Cody. Yeah, um, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, you're dead right when you say the word jobs, jobs, jobs. <laughs> um, but how lucky are we to be fortunate to have um, that that funding from government, you've been able to receive that. Um, because I, one of my fears around the whole situation we're in now with COVID is being able to keep people here on the coast when um, there is that fear that if they don't have any work, then they are going to have to look elsewhere. And then when we do come back and hopefully not in the not too distant future into some form of recovery mode, that, um, you know, where are these people going to then be able to come from to refill these roles again? Um, and especially if we're losing particular people that have a lot of either history and experience in those pre-existing roles that they were in. So um, yeah, this is this is a great opportunity, and I'm really pleased um, that you have put quite a bit of the focus of this as well into down round in the South Westland area, because um, I know down there, you know, I mean, everyone's feeling the pinch, mm -hmm. but you know, they've taken a massive hit, and um, if we can do whatever we can, well, you guys can by supporting those um, locals in the community to keep them, and not just them, but their families with them. Because let's face it, if they, if one person goes, a family goes, you know, and that has a, a much more bigger impact on uh, the actual community and the economy in the community too. Thank you, Councillor. And, and, and again, I do just want to acknowledge, and Paul sort of alluded to it, um, I mean, our uh, dock operations manager in South West and Wayne Costello is, has absolutely been, um, um, I suppose, the driver and the leader in this space. I mean, he, you know, the department and our staff, we live and work in those communities, we understand them. Um, and certainly Wayne has taken this, um, you know, really um, and led it because he knows he has to. Um, and again, with tremendous support from Paul um, and the McCarthy executive with Cara Edwards, um, and we wouldn't have been able to do it if we hadn't have stood up that pilot and learned and then been able to scale up to 50. And we want to go further, um, but we do need a bit of time for planning. Councillor Hart. Um, thanks for your presentation. I just had a couple of questions. The, the $200 million funding, is that specific to areas? No. We so can access, we yeah, can access. So, um, I mean, the words I've used is the better, I suppose, framed up we are as, as a, a region um, and to get more than our fair share, um, but we are going to have to bid for it. I don't know how that's going to yeah. come yet. Um, at the moment, we're getting the quick wins. There's been um, um, money allocated to South Westland to, to scale up the pilot, which has basically gone past the, the regional alliance just to... to Get going, um, but we we will have to bid into that two hundred million. And how do, how do people in the community access it? Is it only through Doc seeing the the you know the spaces that need filled or the areas that need? Like, how does the community? That's the next stage of how right. once we've got the alliance up and running. Because at the moment we we have focused in South Westland because that's where the greatest needs been. Yeah. Um, but the alliance will actually have to run some kind of bidding, allocation, assessment process. But we're we're a wee way away from that. Yeah, yeah. That's but cool. that's coming. Mike, it sounds uh, it sounds brilliant, and every one of those fifty. Uh, will be shopping locally. In a lot of cases, their kids are maintaining the school role. Mm -hmm. It's enabling the local policemen to, to stay. It's very, very important. And uh, yeah. you know, I, I, uh, I applaud you to, for getting to 50, yeah. because uh, in, a, in a small place like Fox and Friends, um, shucks, it's, a, it's a great hunt. Keep it up, I mean, it's, it's brilliant. Any other, any other questions for me? 
Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just a comment that um, regarding Prince Joseph Place Your Guides, which of course we launched last weekend, but uh, we came two weekends ago. Um, but without jobs and nature as a backstop, um, that, that would not have been viable. Um, so that's, that's how um, essential this is. And um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it cuts to the heart of keeping the, the fabric of the community intact, you know, right down to the John volunteers and the people and the fire brigades and everything. I mean, you know, once you start leading all these staff, um, it undermines the community and then community liability. Um, so it's not just about the loss of jobs, it's the loss of community. Right. So jobs and nature is doing a really, filling a really um, important role. This is not our normal business. <laughs> no. And, um, and so, you know, we are only able to do what we're doing because we have got the support of our treaty partner and um, the broader community uh, because, you know, we, we see that we are an organisation that can do this stuff, but it's not our normal job. So we're learning as we, we're doing it too. Absolutely. Well, I think it's, uh, it's just congratulations and, and it's making, to me, it's making a significant difference. Would someone like to move that the report be received? Happy to move. Councillor Martin, Councillor Hart, those in favour? Thank you. Mark, thanks very much for that. It was, it's, uh, that's very encouraging. If you'd said you only had three people, it would have been not so good, but 50 people, that, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> it, it really is. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Councillors, the next item on the agenda is the Ghost Town Trail and uh, Council Management is going to give us a, a verbal update on uh, we were going there. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, so um, it's been, it's been, this document been circulated in Teams. Technology is wonderful, isn't it? Uh, so this, this was only sent this morning, so uh, did you want me to read through it, perhaps, or just to summarise? Uh, it in summarise in your hand, sir. Um, So firstly, the, uh, so this has been um, something that I, I just raised um, at Mayors and Chairs um, meeting um, a couple of months ago. Um, the, uh, then um, His Worship um, got back to me and said that he wanted to uh, put it on the agenda for discussion here. Um, and in the meantime, also um, was approached um, by Joe Bernie uh, from Development West Coast last week I met with her. Um, and she was keen to, um, um, to talk about it as well. Uh, so I just uh, um, put together a, a, a pricey of what I envisage. It's really quite simple. So it's, it's really about creating a road journey um, that uh, connects um, West Coast ghost towns, um, and, and I mean real ghost towns, I mean, one have no one left them at all. And, um, and just to uh, stitch all that together into a, um, yes, into a, a, a road journey that would, um, that can tell stories, um, untold stories of this coast, um, and with the idea being to retain people um, give them a, an extra reason to stay long on this coast and, and, um, and basically explore. And so, um, I mean, that, um, but the, it's something that would, could benefit the entire West Coast, uh, right from Lyle um, to um, Gillespie's Beach, Hunts Beach, Beach even um, all of these had, um, had um, great histories and um, at one stage, um, big, relatively big populations. Some of these ghost towns were as big as 5,000 people. Um, and uh, today, um, this isn't 5,000 people, that, you know, that's not an exaggeration, as some stories tend to exaggerate, um, but uh, the likes of Edison's Flat and, and, um, and Charleston 
uh, not Charleston, but um, uh, Brighton um, and um, Goldsboro, they did have um, you know, four or 5,000 people. Um, and now um, there's nothing there but the stories. Um, and there are some, you know, some of these towns mm. have, have um, old uh, historic um, cemeteries um, that can be explored. But the, the, the idea could be as low tech as um, putting together a map and a brochure and um, to outline some of the stories um, and let people go. Where they go and they explore um, on their own account. Um, or it could be high tech and it could be um, with the development of an app mm. um, that could, um, could tell more of the stories and you could have more imagery and, and, um, um, and you could have virtual reality and, and all sorts of possibilities with this. And, and people can, uh, could pick off um, as much or as little of the, of the trails they could felt like chilling. Um, and, and it's not only about the ghost town trail either, it's also about um, once, you're, once you hit the road and you're on the, on the trail, you know, you're taking the, um, the other things that are in the area. Um, it links in very, very well with part of the pathway. Um, and then uh, there are all the other, um, other things to explore on the west coast. And it just, I just saw it as a possibility of another reason for people to stay a little bit longer. And so it's basically just throwing an idea out there for someone to pick up and maybe um, and, and um, give, give it a go. Um, I don't see that it's need to cost much at all, really. It's just a concept and it's just a matter of, of um, promotion. That's it. And the rest is there to read. And, mm. As you like. Well, it's a uh, it's pass around the table. I, I was surprised at uh, how many ghost towns there are. I thought it was only off the top of the head. There are probably twice. But well, that day, the main ones. You can ask um, Paul what Joe Bernie intended to do once you follow your conversation with him. Um, she was um, thinking about how they might be able to. Um, uh, look at this in relation to um, some other project. Right. Under Frozen West Coast, in some capacity, or was it? A... Uh, no, no, she was looking at um, possible funding okay. stream to, um, but I don't know who was actually going to pick it up. Mm. Um, mm. so, uh, Councillor Martin. Thank you very much, Worship, and thank you very much for the um, presentation, Paul. Um, my brain, the little cogs going around at the moment, you probably can't see them, but <laughs> I'm just thinking about um, the strategic fit with um, body of work that Heritage West Coast is doing around um, trying to um, support the education aspect in schools with, them, with this. And it's just sort of, as, as you were saying, and I was sort of thinking, this is actually quite niche as well. So there's actually a lot of people that do this sort of stuff and get their kicks out of it by going to places to discover lost towns. And I mean, I'm not one of them, but some people really do, you know, they, they love this and fossil king and get their metal detector out and all those sorts of things that this really um, would appeal to. So it's like, how do you, because what you've actually got here is a whole lot of really fantastic IP that you know. And it's like, how do you get that into a way that it's accessible and somehow returns economic benefit, which I can see it's got, it's oozing economic benefit. So I'm just thinking about us and the advocacy role we can play is we're finding out where DWC actually sit in terms of funding a work stream like this and whether partnerships with the likes of Heritage West Coast would enable something that they maybe already have undertaken or undertaking to fit within or this could sit around. I don't know the answer to that. I'm not on here at the West Coast. I just know a little bit about what they're trying to do with getting into schools and stuff. And because I think we should get right in behind it and support it. It's when you think about the, the, what we've discussed today, a lot of that was sort of immediate and right here, right now presentations and sort of big wow. And this to me is something that actually has longevity even though it may be 
micro to start, it actually provides, like the cycle trail, right? It was small to start, but then it provides long-term strategic and um, benefits to the district and the region. So all of that brain dump of mine really means, I think our next action is how do we fund the development of more than just a brochure, actually making it quite an interactive experience for people that would see the West Coast as a destination for something like this. Mm. Councillor Cody. Well, once again, you know, God, you're like a bloody encyclopedia of knowledge with um, <laughs> yeah. where all of this history comes from. And I mean, all it, all it does is just constantly raise that whole thing around we're, we're not doing enough to promote our history, but um, it also raises um, concerns around me around how, how do we grab all of this history like this and work like Councillor Martin said in collaboration with other businesses or or, or societies within the district to be able to pull this information together and be able to, you know, have it more readily available and 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 actually get a real strategic plan around how we're going to promote that um, and have it kind of like evolve. You know, it might be you know that it. it one point we're talking about the old mining, you know, towns on the coast, and then we're talking about something else. And um, you know, is that a job that's also linked in around with the museum, or or not? I don't really know. Good, good questions. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll move to we'll move to Councillor Hart first, and then uh, and I think then Joe from DWC may be able to. Um, thanks, Paul. I, no, I, for one, find it quite interesting. Um, and especially I've, I've visited Denston and the incline just intrigues me. But, um, yeah, I'll have a good read. Obviously, I haven't had a, any good at this morning. So, but, yeah, we need to do something with it. Sure. So I saw this from Paul last week, I think, yes, my week's blurred into one. Um, and as I said to Paul, we've got hopefully in a month or two, we're going to have a destination management manager on board. Um, within Port Plymouth, we're also going to have a digital communications person on board. And at that point, it's like, what can we do to start evolving this? I, I agree with Jenny, it, is, it's, it needs to evolve. We can't go straight in. It's starting with the knowledge that we have and growing that and ensuring that we get that information out there a, as quickly as possible, but in a very structured manner. So yes, DWC will have a role to play in that. We just need to work out how it's going to evolve first and then should we evolve it quickly. Would uh, it be very exciting. It's, just, it's first thing and uh, it's, uh, it's not bad. Uh, just sort of like, sorry, sorry it's, it's just a concept. I, I do take on board what the councillors have said about the um, about education um, um, capacity as well. Um, and um, and Councillor Martin's right, you know, this is, it is something that's, that could be part of the school mm. curriculum. You know, they, they need to learn local history. Mm. Um, mm. Um, this is something that's so easily put together. It could be, um, it could be put together in, in, um, in a really quick time, um, and um, but I think if it's going to be done at all, it needs to be done done right. Um, but I really see the potential for um, domestic tourism to get on board mm. with something like this, and, and um, yeah, just to. Another way to explore the West Coast. So, thank you. So, I'd like to move that uh, the report be received. Councillor Martin, Councillor Hart, those in favour? Aye. Aye. Um, could you recall that uh, I'll be coming from the meeting and Anna can take over. Anna, could you take over? Um, uh, Simon is going to update on that proposal there. 
and then we move to the, the appointment of the independent right. committee. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Okay, moving on. Um, Simon, would you be able to update us on the PG funding? So I forgot to uh, mention, Chair, that Penny Bickman was an apology today, uh, but she has provided me an update in terms of the current process regarding our PGF application. So from Monday, uh, the 20th of July, Cabinet meet to discuss the CIP IRG projects that are, be, uh, that are to be contracted to the PDU and will formally approve and finance it appropriately. Um, fingers crossed that that goes smoothly. And receipt of uh, the Cabinet minutes, we'll, we'll receive letters of approval for all of our various projects that were been, been um, discussed last week and announced last week. Um, then there will be 20 working days to complete the contracts uh, with those, um, those contracts. So there is at least 30 odd days uh, between now and getting those contracts finalised. Depending on what the contracts state, they could be turned around quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And the expectation is that within two months of signing contracts, works start. So we have some challenges um, in terms of timing uh, for some of these, and they're all obviously different types of contracts that we'll be doing. Um, but uh, the challenge will be trying to maintain business as usual as well as doing extraordinary work. So we have, uh, we have contracted or about to contract a project manager to take the lead for some of the council projects and for the airport as well, with destination management. That will take some um, pressure away when we set up a project office to believe that. So we'll um, hopefully get that underway shortly. Any questions? Um, I'll open it up for any questions. Paul. Um, thank you. No, 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 no questions. Councillor Martin. Thank you. Chair, um, I think that it's fantastic we're receiving this money. There must be some sort of fish hook around this because, you know, the ability to, to deliver within two months is... No, it's to start. Well, to start. Yeah, that's all about that. The expectation to start is, is fantastic, provided a lot of the bureaucracy that's imposed is also <laughs> removed as well. Not from us, from above. Um, so, <laughs> I dare say there'll be a lot of conditions. Yeah, the that's what I'm. There will be, um, won't be able to be removed. So, we have to work within those. That's, that's exactly right. It's like jump, but these are the things you have to do before you can jump. So, that's that's the trade off. And I think, um, close, uh, I think I really support the uh, the concept of a, um, a project sort of management or separation from day to day work streams of the council. So, we don't get that blurred and we don't just detract from our capital works program yeah. so the ability to actually resource that appropriately i fully support and that group people whatever needs to somehow report back into yeah, so a number of council on. committees i'm thinking yeah so it'll be through the capital projects tenders committee will be the reporting line um, or full council depending on the timing so either one mm. so we expect the next capital projects tenders committee will have a report regarding the procurement process because we have to um, slightly modify our procurement process to actually achieve the time frame as well. So it'll be a short tender process for most of those projects. Um, but we'll put that policy changes through to the Capital Projects Tenders Committee for endorsement. We've also taken feedback from Department of Internal Affairs and MB because they contradict each other in terms of um, processes. So we we have to make sure that um, we're not going to shortcut what is considered due, you know, proper due process and also meet the time frames provided. So it's a real challenge in both points. Thank you. Councillor Kogan. No, I have no further questions. Cool. Um, if there's no further questions, do we move that there? Verbal report be accepted. Can I have a mover, please? Councillor Martin. Second, Councillor Cogan. Okay. Um, 
We're up to number seven on the agenda, which is on sorry on which is number pages six on your agenda, and it's the appointment of the independent committee members. Pass it over to Chief Executive. Yes, uh, so thank you, Chair. Um, so if you recall the last economic development committee, we looked to bolster up the um, intellectual capability around the um, committee table. So I've gone through and had uh, various discussions with um, individuals to support that approach. So um, the concept is to invite um, members of uh, our relevant CCOs, um, Peter Cuff, the chair of Destination uh, West Roads, uh, and Joan Conroy, chair of uh, Holdings, um, slash director on um, Destination Westland as well. And also invite um, the Economic Development Manager for um, Development West Coast, Joe Bernie, who has been participating today. So, <laughs> uh, providing insights today. Um, so it, what it does is actually creates line of sight also with the work that Durham West Coast is doing and also the line of sight with the strategies that both our key CCOs are also providing. So um, I'll take the rest of the report as read and open up for any um, further comments. Thank you, Simon. Uh... Cool. Do you have any questions? Uh, thanks. Um, no, no questions, um, but I think it's a very sensible move. Welcome. Okay. Council Martin. Thank you very much for the report, Simon. I support the recommendations. I think it's, um, it seems to be a consistent theme today, but getting lots of people in the same room that represent different interests can only lead to good if a process and decisions if it actually respecting everyone's view and we're all working towards the same outcomes and that's what I like about this recommendation it's bringing the right people into the right room further to that though I think we need to go one step further and I would actually advocate for the um, receiving and uh, approving the recommendation as proposed but also to um, to seek um, expressions of interest from um, from business in terms of um, someone sitting on the count on the committee or two people, and that's based on the fact that when I look across the interests of the committee and the representation, it does feel quite weighted towards Hukatika, and there seems to be potentially a um, uh, represent representation imbalance for what could be someone from South Western, for example that provides a spread and that would be where something like a an, an public expressions of interest process might allow um, two people to put their names forward, for example, that could also join the committee because it's one thing for us as the committee to hand select people, which I think you're bringing the right people around the table, but also there could be some industry, industry reps that could add value that may want to add value as well, rather than being sort of told they have to because it's their job. And I think they might provide a different perspective as well. And that's kind of where I'm coming at with the, the feeling that um, although DWC and us as a council has a, is a district wide view and should be taking a district wide view, just hear so much stuff around South Westland that it might be quite nice to have someone that's nominated by or expresses interest expresses an interest from that community to put their name forward for this and then go through quite an open selection process in the same way we would for any other appointment, direct appointment, basically run a very similar, but that would be my thoughts. Um, and to have one or two more people on it provide alternative perspectives to me is, is not a bad thing. Can I just make a recommendation that we will receive this report but take as an action to explore that other avenue and bring another report back? Future day. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'd be quite keen to hear other members. That's just my my thoughts. It doesn't have to necessarily be adopted, but I just think it would provide balance and just the fact that the councillors are also um, Hukatika and Northern based yeah, councillors. Just wondered that if there's an opportunity for a Southern Ward councillor on this committee, bringing that. 
Um, yeah, the committee was set up obviously as part of inauguration, but mm -hmm. um, that can always be changed through his worship in yeah. terms of him actually um, appointing a further councillor. Mm. But don't get me wrong, I absolutely support the, the um, connections with our subsidiaries in Development West Coast. I think getting those relationships right at a governance level is a very important thing. Just to make one other further comment, the three parties nominated today are also meant to represent all of Westland, not just the local tickets. So West Road obviously has impact right across the coast. Um, also, uh, the destination of Westland uh, has obviously business interests as well. Uh, down the south as well. Yeah. And obviously, mm. Joe is for the whole West Coast. Mm. Through, through the chair, of course, Councillor Hatchell was a business friend. Mm. He might be a logical choice. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I'll certainly um, put it forward that we consider it ahead of the next meeting. Mm. Oh, Councillor Kogan. Um, yeah, no, that was. Um, Look, I fully support the recommendation for uh, the extra people to come on. I mean, now more than ever, our, this economic development um, portfolio that we all sit under is going to become really vital in the next two years. Um, and I think the more people with more varied experience and knowledge and also know-how of what's actually going on, um, around the table is going to be vital because it's not just going to be a case of us attending these meetings, which has been a concern of mine in the past, that we would come along and we would have these economic development meetings and talk about a lot of stuff, but we would actually, then there would be no follow through and, and action. Um, and um, I have to say today, like it's been heartening having Joe there in the background being able to fill in some of those gaps when, you know, we've raised different uh, concerns um, and knowing that there are, but what we talk about, you know, will have be able to have the right people in the right places to ensure it's followed through. So yeah, fully support them. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not convinced um, with Councillor Martin. Um, as to whether we would need a two more um, on board. I, I think that we should consider somebody, but I'm so aware that, um, and Joe may be able to clarify this for me, that there has been, um, through just uh, Development West Coast, an economic development com committee that's been formed. Um, that does also have representatives from down around the glacier region businesses on that. Um, oh, no, either. so we've got the tourism recovery group, we've got the COVID recovery group. Yeah, and as well, yeah, so the COVID has got on the tourism recovery, so we've got two different groups there, one specifically on tourism. Yeah. Um, and then one is business across the whole coast, which again we have down south. And then we'll also have the alliance, which Mark was mentioning before, which again takes note of down south. So, and um, from my perspective, I've got good coverage of the whole of the West Coast, and mm. um, especially from an economic perspective. Yeah. Yep, that's all from me. Yep, I fully support it. All right, so the recommendation is that Council approve the appointment of Joe Burney, Economic Development Manager, DWC, Peter Cuff, Chair of West Roads, and Joanne Conroy, Chair of Western Holdings and Destination Westland, to the Economic Development Committee as independent committee members and instructs the Chief Executive to modify the committee terms and references to reflect the changes. Could I have a move for that recommendation? Thank Councillor Kogan, second. Councillor Martin, because you are here. Um, all those in favour? Yep. Aye. Cool. Right, next. Um, could I please have a Move it to go to public excluded, please. 
Councillor Martin, Councillor Kogan. And could we please stop the live streaming?